Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, wherever you are in the world, in your different time zones. And welcome very warmly to this webinar on the transparency of private commercial education providers hosted by the Global Initiative for Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. My name is Monica Kiria. I'll be your moderator today. I'm a senior advisor at the UFO Anti-Corruption Resource Center, where I work on anti-corruption in public service delivery and gender and corruption. So welcome to you and uh, we'll go right ahead so that we can keep time. And um, we hope that more and more people will join us as we proceed throughout um, the hour. There's no universally agreed definition of transparency, which is the main thing we'll be discussing today, but it has been promoted as an element of good governance for many years. In general, it relates to the right to know and access public information and the capacity of outsiders to obtain valid and timely information about the activities of government or private organizations. The right to information is considered an enabling right, which facilitates people to better achieve their other human rights and to more effectively participate in public discussions on policy and government activities that affect them. So transparency is not just something for the sake of itself, but a crucial element of good governance and good public policy. The right to information, which is tied to transparency, is recognized under Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it's also the subject of Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So it's well established in international law. It's also included at national level by over 125 countries in freedom of information laws that have been enacted by various parliaments. Traditionally, human rights law was conceived of as applying mostly to governments and not to corporations. However, transparency has always been seen as an element of good corporate governance, although this is often seen as relating to financial transparency and the duty of companies to disclose their finances and other activities to their shareholders. However, today we know that human rights is not just something that applies to governments, but to corporations too. And that's why we have the United Nations Global Compact, an initiative that global corporations can sign, committing to responsible business practices in the area of human rights, um, especially labor rights, the environment, and also their duty to prevent and address corruption. Above all, when it comes to the education sector, we have the Abidjan principles, which were enacted in 2019 on the human rights obligations of states to provide public education and to regulate private involvement in education. The Abidjan principles specify that when they deliver and exercise governance over education, states must apply principles of transparency and accountability. That's guiding principle number 20. And under guiding principle number 55, states must also ensure that private education providers act transparently. So this underscores the reason why we are here today and why the Global Initiative for Economic, Social and Cultural Rights has invited us to this very important discussion and to present to us the findings of their research on transparency of private commercial for-profit education providers, especially Bridge International Academies, as a case study of this in this sector. We are also here to discuss the importance of transparency in the education sector more generally, and the obligations of different actors to uphold standards. And of course, we'll be focusing mostly on private corporations. Today, we are very glad that our discussion will be led by four panelists. 
um, we have Susanna Mitre, who is, did I pronounce that correctly? I hope so. Uh, who is the program officer on the right to education at the Global Initiative for Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Susanna has over five years of experience working in the human rights field on issues such as the right to education, equality and non-discrimination. She has also worked on Roma rights, economic justice, access to justice and the rule of law. You're welcome, Susanna. We look forward to hearing your presentation. We also have with us Ashina, who is the Africa representative at the Global Initiative for Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. She has worked in human rights for many years at the intersection of global and national struggles of public service delivery to ensure that everyone is able to enjoy their socioeconomic rights. Welcome, Ashina. We are also very glad to have with us Johnston Shisanya who is the project manager of the education support project of the East African Center for Human Rights. He has over seven years experience in community empowerment and development, human rights advocacy, the right to education, child protection and safeguarding among others. Johnston, we are very glad to have you with us today. And lastly, we have Anderson Niamen, who is the executive director of the Center for Transparency and Accountability in Liberia and National Coordinator of the Coalition for Transparency and Accountability in Education. He has over 10 years of experience as an anti-corruption advocate and a promoter of democratic governance and the rule of law. Anderson, you're very welcome. We look forward to Thank your you. contribution. So before we move on to our discussion today, I would like to address you, our participants, you're very welcome to post your questions in the Q&A tab, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and also use the chat tab for any other discussion. Questions in the Q&A tab and other issues in the chat tab, please. I'll now hand over to our first speaker, Zuzana, to present her findings on the transparency uh, of private commercial education providers. Susanna, you're welcome. The floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Monica, for that introduction. Um, I hope you can see my screen um, because I uh, started sharing it. Just um, let me start this PowerPoint presentation as well. Okay, so um, today, as Monica has already kindly um, introduced this topic, um, I'll be discussing um, the transparency of private commercial education providers, um, the case study of Bridge International Academies. Um, this is a um, research brief that we are publishing today. Um, please um, look for it on our website and it will be posted, uh, the link to this publication will also be posted here by Juana um, in the chat box. So let us begin um, with, with um, the presentation of, of this brief, brief and our findings. To give you a quick overview, um, after a short introduction, we'll be looking at why um, we have chosen Bridge International Academies as our focus. Um, we'll be turning then to Bridges um, transparency record with respect to its operations and impacts, um, its transparency record with um, respect to its openness to external scrutiny, and finally we'll draw some conclusions and recommendations. So first of all, um, our core argument is that both public and private education should be conducted in a clear and transparent manner that enables everyone um, including parents, teachers, school heads, officials working in ministries of education and other state services, researchers, taxpayers, uh, funders of education, to understand the implications of the right to education, the cost of schools, uh, the performance of schools, as well as the, as the quality of education that learners receive. Our brief discusses the transparency obligations of corporate commercial education providers and specifically um, that of Bridge International Academies. Um, and as I said, it, um, it will draw some conclusions and make recommendations. So um, 
as Monica has kindly introduced already, um, transparency requirements um, uh, that uh, oblige um, all actors um, in the education sector. Um, we still have to say that unfortunately, transparency remains um, a challenge in education. But what we're looking at today is whether private involvement is really improving it. Um, we're posing this question because in, the, in recent years, um, the public sector has often been criticized for failing education due to uh, bureaucracy, vested interest, conservatism, and oftentimes um, corruption. And um, in 2009, for instance, the United Kingdom's aid agency, uh, DFID, suspended aid to Kenya's primary education services following allegations of corruption in, in the Ministry of Education of Kenya. Um, these and similar criticisms of public education have led some donors, including DFID, um, and policymakers to argue that private sector is more transparent and accountable than the public sector, primarily because uh, parents have more say over the managers and teachers of private schools, and as a result, it's easier to hold them to account. Um, this, these arguments have encouraged a rise in, in um, private sector involvement um, in education, and many more uh, commercial companies across the world have become involved in delivering and financing education serv services. More countries rely increasingly on, on market mechanisms to ensure accountability. However, there is little solid evidence um, that private sector involvement brings accountability benefits, and uh, there's even evidence that leans the other way. And the record of bridge suggests, for example, that privatization does not necessarily improve um, transparency. So why have we chosen to focus on bridge? Um, bridge International Academies is um, a subsidiary of an American registered for-profit corporation, uh, New Globe Schools, and it runs private pre-primary uh, and primary schools. And it's one of the world's largest uh, low fee uh, private school. Um, it operates uh, across five countries and it has um, been hailed as an innovative tech-based solution um, on the ground that it fix uh, transparency and accountability challenges just faced by the public sector. Um, but it has been also said that it offers affordable education of good quality to underserved families and children. It has received um, funding from both public and private investors. Um, including uh, the International Finance Corporation. Um, and uh, it in 2018, it reported that it operated over 500 schools um, in the five countries it operates in, uh, and they aimed to teach or reach 10 million pupils by 2025. So the scale uh, of this school also made it a good choice um, um, for closer scrutiny. Um, so this uh, tech-based um, innovation, the so-called academy in a box, um, a highly standardized education approach, and all this, these arguments from, from the donors and policymakers and education around transparency issues in the public sectors um, have put um, a lot of fate uh, um, in this uh, schools and promise, and it became a flagship investment for many investors. Um, at the same time, it also received criticism um, from a range of educational institutions and actors um, who have alleged that it hasn't delivered on its results or um, there has been obscured documentation um, proving its results. It's treated its staff and learners inequitably and has been hostile to criticism. So now we are going to look at the criticism made of Bridge and Bridge's response to these criticisms insofar as it relates to two important aspects of transparency. Um, transparency regarding Bridge's operations and impact and its openness to external scrutiny. So let's see the first, um, um, its operations and impacts. First, um, we'll talk about accuracy of the marketing information Bridge uh, has provided about itself. Many complaints have been raised about the veracity and completeness of marketing information. So for example, in Kenya, um, um, many claims um, surfaced that teachers uh, teaching at Bridge International Academies were expected to, um, in addition to their teaching uh, duties, to expand the client portfolio and um, market Bridge in the communities um, in, in weekends and sometimes on holidays. 
Um, bridge schools have described themselves as community or in, in Ke the Kenyan context, Karambe schools to appear indigenous and attract local support uh, and benefit from a lighter regulatory framework that is for um, these uh, community schools. Uh, but this has been challenged continuously by the Ministry of Education and they've been advised to register as a fully private school as they do not um, um, qualify as a community school. Um, sorry. Um, in Uganda as well, um, the Ministry of Education and Sport has issued statements um, in which it has declared that Bridge has used aggressive and misleading promotion um, regarding the quality and affordability of its services for the pure, uh, poor. In relation to the exam results, um, Bridge has celebrated itself um, um, annually um, what it has referred to as uh, receiving or reaching above average examination results. Um, but some criticisms um, uh, have been made uh, in relation to these results in Kenya as well. Um, first of all, oh, we can say with um, confidence that exam results are a limited way of gauging the quality of, of learning. It's a much more um, complex uh, concept than that. Um, there have been allegations of selecting students to sit exams, um, the creation of cram schools to, to prepare students for these exams. And even if, if um, uh, Bridges metric uh, for um, uh, analyzing exam results are expected, um, the declared results appear to be inconsistent over time and even inconsistent in some years. Um, and this um, absence in consistency makes it difficult to verify and analyze these results independently as a layperson. Um, as this is in conflict with, with its promise of accountability for learning. Um, you in the publication, you can find um, figures detailing some of these results in, uh, please consult them. Regarding enrollment, um, concerns have uh, surfaced in this relation as well, um, regarding the consistency of the declared enrollment numbers and lack of clarity um, regarding Bridges own data. Um, there's lack of data on school dropouts, which is often a likely contributor to, to declining enrollment numbers. And interestingly, Bridge has reported these in a disaggregated way enrollment figures until 2020, when it has changed its website. And since then, um, it does not disclose information um, on this. Um, so again, it's difficult to determine um, the actual enrollment in the countries where Bridge operates. Um, it seems that there has been a steady growth in the first phase until 2015. Then from 20, 2015, there's been a bit of a stagnation and until 2017, even a decline in enrollment. Um, again, there's a figure um, um, detailing this in the publication. I'd like to um, um, ask you to look at that in more detail. We're also, we have also looked at the response to the COVID-19 pandemic by Bridge. Um, and after the schools closed um, during the pandemic, Bridge officially announced that it was supporting its staff and teachers, and they would continue to pay them monthly salaries. However, um, in reality, media reports reveal that in Kenya, staff uh, were sent home on compulsory leaves without a salary or were only paid an equivalent of 10% of their salary. Similarly, in Liberia, complaints were um, um, registered with the Ministry of Labor um, that Bridge has reduced their salary to 80 or 90 percent, which was in direct uh, contradiction with um, a government decree prohibiting pay cuts larger than uh, 50 uh, percent. Um, now I'll turn to the um, transparency regarding openness um, of um, openness to external scrutiny um, within this company. Uh, as already mentioned briefly, Bridges, um, the wholly owned subsidiary of New Globe Schools Inc., which is a company that is registered in Delaware in the USA. It's also known to be a secrecy jurisdiction and as, has been qualified as a tax haven. Um, it's known to impose weak transparency requirements on, transfer, on um, corporations, so it's very difficult to um, obtain information about Bridge um, from, from this company registered. This raises concerns as well. Um, 
suppressing criticism. In many cases, Bridge has uh, resisted rather than facilitated attempts to obtain information about what it does. Um, and um, it has uh, um, been resistant to uh, go under independent scrutiny. So for example, in 2016, um, it's been said that Bridge had orchestrated uh, the arrest of a Canadian PhD student who was doing his doctoral research on Bridge in Uganda. Um, then these um, um, allegations against the student uh, were dropped. Um, on, they were made on false grounds. In 2017, Bridge sued the Kenyan National Union of Teachers and its Secretary um, uh, General for Defamation, claiming that they were casting um, Bridge in a bad light. Um, but the court, the Kenyan court dismissed um, this claim and upheld the right to make fair comment on matters of public interest and in the public domain and dismissed um, this application. Uh, Bridge also threatened to sue the chair of the Kenyan Complementary Schools um, um, sorry, uh, Association if um, he failed to retract the statement, statement in which he raised concerns about Bridge's curriculum. And it's important to note that the Ministry of Education um, consistently um, has uh, declared that Bridge's curriculum does not confirm with the national curriculum. Um, there were, there's many issues of, of transparency regarding Bridges operations in Liberia under a, a large scale public private partnership, but this will be discussed by Anderson um, soon. And just to conclude, um, why we focused on Bridge, it's because it's a large company in receipt of uh, public funds and it runs schools in several countries. Um, it, therefore, one would assume that it has the resources and the expertise to report accurately and provide information that is accessible to the public about its actions. But the evidence strongly suggests that its culture is insufficiently transparent. And uh, this is a problem because um, lack of transparency undermines trust, facilitates misuse of limited resources and conceals abuse, corruption, and undermine social justice. And in, edu in education particularly, it can put at risk um, very large populations of children who are already inherently vulnerable and they may experience poor quality teaching, dangerous to health, physical safety, and different risks, um, uh, risks of different kind um, um, regarding their development. For these reasons, education institutions have a particular responsibility to to be accountable and transparent. And also because especially corporations providing education are um, providing a public good that should be um, a, a service provided by, by um, public. So it assumes that it should be conducted in a transparent way. The question remains, how can transparency be improved in the education system? Well, states and donors should work together to make sure that all education providers are held to high standards of transparency and accountability, and that um, it's possible for all stakeholders to monitor and analyze the quality of education governance and reporting of education expenditure and performance. It's also important that where, where states engage private actors um, in the delivery um, or organization of their education system, they should always carefully consider the diversity of, of these actors and the risks associated with the different models of education provided by these different actors, mainly because um, especially this is true with regards to commercial providers, um, that they have an additional incentive to present positive results in terms of performance and value for money because the results they present directly affect their ability to attract funds. And this is something that states and education authorities should uh, particularly um, um, keep in mind and address specifically. Um, and finally, to complement state efforts um, in holding private uh, providers of education accountable, um, they should maintain high standards and the private sector alliances should also uh, set and enforce stringent transparency and accountability guidelines for their members which draw on human rights standards. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope I only exceeded the time just a little tiny bit. Thank you. The floor is yours, um, Johnson. Thank you. 
um, very much, Susie. That was a very sobering presentation um, and informative as well. Johnston, you're welcome to tell us about uh, the experience of Kenya with low fee paying private schools. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, welcome all to our audience. Uh, uh, for my presentation, I don't have a PowerPoint, it's just a summary. And I want to touch on a number of uh, areas. One, I want to highlight the genesis, uh, how the low fee paying, uh, paying private schools emerged in Kenya. Number two, I'll be looking at the areas uh, that uh, indicate or the indicators of lack of uh, transparency in these low fee uh, private schools. And then number three, I'll be looking at the initiatives by the state and uh, other actors like each rights, how we are coming in to make sure that the aspect of uh, lack of transparency is being addressed. And finally, I'll be able to highlight one or two recommendations. So to begin with, um, I will say uh, the genesis or where the emergence of uh, low fee uh, paying private schools in Kenya mushroomed was in 2009, uh, moving to 2013. Uh, at the beginning of 2003, there was uh, a call uh, by the state where it introduced what we call the free primary education. So with the free primary education, the enrollment rate really grew very high. Uh, yet the government or the, the state had not established well uh, mechanisms that would be able to absorb the influx of children in this enrollment. In 2013, there was free day secondary school, the same scenario built on the free primary education, where the numbers uh, of enrollment in schools were very high. So this challenge of lack of um, adequate infrastructure uh, by the government to absorb all the, uh, uh, the numbers in terms of enrollment opened the Pandora box for the low fee paying private schools to mushroom. And most of them now grew up in the informal settlements where we have the highest population in Kenya. And this is where um, most of them began to operate. Now, uh, in terms of the operations, uh, many of these schools did not register or in, uh, initially did not start as schools. They started as community-based organization, charitable institutions uh, offering community services. But later on, because of the gap that was existing and because of the opportunity that was prevailing by then, many of the schools now emerged starting changing even from charitable or community-based institutions into schools. So slowly by slowly, they began to set up uh, the current schools that we are seeing. And in the informal settlements in Nairobi alone, we have over 3,000 in institutions or the low fee paying private schools. And these institutions are the ones we are looking at in terms of the aspect of lack of transparency. I would say the government of Kenya is really making uh, quite uh, a, a tremendous efforts in terms of trying to build on its um, aspirations of realizing quality education for every child. This is one of the Vision 2030 aspirations. This is one of their mandates that is being uh, triggered towards uh, attaining the SDG number four. However, the challenge of this uh, low fee pay, uh, paying private schools is still huge. One is because they have now come up into uh, what we call uh, circus or uh, formed kind of coalitions. And these coalitions uh, have certain individuals who purport to speak on their behalf. And now they are really uh, changing the game every day when the government says these schools need to be registered. They stand up and say, you know, we have a right also to run, but they are not following the structure. So now moving into the areas of lack of transparency, as each rise, uh, we look at this in terms of two uh, paradigm uh, or in two perspective. One is lack of accountability and lack of adherence to the government policies. Number two is lack of openness towards the parents, providing information to the parents who take children in these schools. So those two aspects stands out very strongly. And these two aspects, I'm going to elaborate them into the five uh, indicators that the government has put in place in terms of the measure of quality education. So the first thing is 
lack of decision, lack of decision uh, making structures. Most of these institutions or these schools do not have a structured uh, um, a leadership where you will find the, the proprietor of the school is also a teacher, is also the manager, is also the financier. So in this kind of setup, you realize that in terms of transparency, even how they account for the resources, it's not there. They don't have that openness where the parents can hold them accountable. Number two is lack of disclosure in terms of income. And this is where I mentioned most of them started like a charitable institutions and converted into schools. So some of them still use these same institutions to earn some money from the donors in the name of supporting children in the institutions. Yet some of these children uh, are not catered for in terms of how the money is uh, uh, given to the institution. So lack of that disclosure, how much money is coming from the donor and what is it is supposed to be uh, uh, a supply to the children is not there. Number three is the inappropriateness in terms of curriculum, which uh, Sushi has also highlighted. Most of these schools do not have adequate teachers. When we talk about curriculum, first of all, we are looking at the competency of the teachers to be able to offer that curriculum. So if you don't have trained teachers, then it's not possible even if you have the right curriculum to implement that curriculum. Number two, most of them do not have approved curriculum because they are not registered in the first place. They are not legally recognized by the state. Number three, there is that issue of registration, which is a very big. As we speak now, we have a new formation of uh, what we call a major group uh, consisting of leadership from a number of these uh, formed groups from the informal settlements that runs these schools. And what we are trying to really pressure on, and this is also uh, a force that's coming from the government, is to make sure that these schools are registered by the government under the Ministry of Education under the new guidelines of registration for basic education institutions so that they can be able to be uh, strictly uh, adhere to the guidelines and also be able to be monitored by the government. Number four is the lack of welfare for the learners. If you move our research that has been done and the mapping that has been done in these schools, you realize there is very little voices from the children and even the parents themselves. When a parent realizes there is a problem and they want to raise a concern, they are always told, take your child somewhere else. We don't have that space here. And that is a very uh, big challenge. And finally, there is an aspect of hidden school fees. You know, they invite children, say we are supporting children, we are on sponsorship. Then slowly they graduate and say, you need to pay this and that. They don't disclose at the beginning when the parent bring the children that this is the amount of money you need to pay. So from the beginning, parents come knowing that this is a sponsor school. We don't have to pay, but they end up now finding themselves into a situation where they'll not be able to pay. So in, uh, in summary now, when we are looking at the issue of transparency against what the government has put in place in terms of the indicators, we are looking at these five aspects. One is the leadership and management approach. And I've already hinted out that there is a problem in terms of transparency in the management of law fee paying private schools. Number two, there is an aspect of curriculum organization and implementation where we don't have adequate trained teachers we don't have, at the moment in Kenya, we are have, we're rolling out the new curriculum called competence-based education. And in terms of curriculum, majority of these institutions have not even trained their staff to be able to implement the curriculum. In number three, we are looking at the physical infrastructure. And this physical infrastructure, most of them are uh, settled in the slum areas or in the informal settlements. So they don't have adequate infrastructure to be able to support adequate learning outcomes. Number four, we are looking at the learners welfare, which I've already hinted out that there is a problem in terms of the participation of the children and in terms of the parents' voices on how they are supposed to support their children. And finally, the community involvement is very restricted. So these are the aspects that we look at when you are looking at the aspect of lack of transparency. And to summarize, uh, each rights and the Ministry of Education has been working so hard. We've been moving around. We started within Nairobi County where we engaged the Ministry of Education. We have engaged the three uh, actors who are supposed to regulate and make sure that quality education is adhered to. This is the County Education uh, Board, uh, the quality assurance at the officers, 
and the sub-county directors of education who do uh, a lot of registration for the schools. So our commitment has been uh, that these people need to be sensitized on the new registration guidelines, which has been intensively uh, um, captured in terms of the new curriculum. And number three is now straightforward to the registration. So we are pushing for any institution that uh, uh, purport to offer uh, education is supposed to be registered and regulated by the government. So this is uh, our initiative that we've been working together with the ministry. And we want to see how far we can be able to go in terms of controlling and managing the law fee paying institutions in Kenya. Thank you. That's my presentation. Thank you so much, Johnston. That was very informative. You raised a number of interesting issues and problems and issues of concern. Participants, if you have questions, please remember to post them in the Q&A tab, and then we will discuss them shortly. Next, we are very happy to have Anderson Mayerman from Liberia to share with us his, our Liberia's experience with transparency in this sector. Welcome, Anderson, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Monica. Thank you, um, everyone, for coming. My name is Anderson Miamin. I'm from Liberia, and I head the Coalition for Transparency and Accountability in Education. I'd like to thank my colleagues uh, for the very beautiful presentations they've made. Um, of course, the topic uh, on a review is uh, transparency concerns uh, around uh, private actors in education, uh, British international economies, uh, which is the focus. So my presentation um, um, would, would, would be focused on a um, few things. One, um, I will look briefly at the background of the Liberia Educational Advancement Program in Liberia, uh, under which uh, British international economies is operating. We will look at uh, why we're monitoring that program as an institution. We also will be looking at uh, the how, how have we been doing the monitoring. Um, we will look at key transparency concerns uh, uh, from uh, 2017 when the program was first introduced in like zero and key transparency uh, concerns are currently um, with the program and recommendations uh, for, for, for progress. And for uh, many of you uh, on the call uh, who may not, or people on the call who may not be aware, the Liberia Educational Advancement Program um, is a program of the Ministry of Education or the government of, of, of Liberia that was introduced uh, in 2016 or during the 2016, 2017 school year. At the time, it was called the Partnership School for Liberia, uh, PSL, but then it was rebranded as uh, LIP, Liberia Educational Advancement Program during the 2018-2019 school year. Um, the program began with a pilot of uh, 93 public primary schools, uh, but then um, it was later scaled up. And at the moment, there are three, uh, 525 public primary schools on the program. Um, at the time in 2016, 2017, uh, British International Academies was the loan provider that uh, was handpicked by the Ministry of Education at the time, but due to pressure, public outcry, uh, pressure from civil society, seven other providers were included uh, in the program. Um, the program um, is, is, is heavily criticized and it is the most uh, controversial program uh, in the history of education uh, in Liberia. Like I said, there are 525 schools under the program uh, currently, and of those 525 schools, uh, British International Academies is managing 350 of those schools, which constitute 66.6, uh, or if you run it up, 67% of the schools under the program. Why are we monitoring the program uh, as a civil society organization and evidence-based uh, organization? We want to promote uh, independent uh, monitoring. So the government has this program that is it is implementing along with Bridge and the other providers. 
what we have to do as civil society organizations is to independently track what is happening so that we provide information credible and in, in, independent information to the public and stakeholders about happenings around the program. Uh, wh while are we monitoring also, we are doing this uh, to carry out evidence-based uh, advocacy, for example, to promote inclusion and transparency in the process, to promote and defend the right to education, and to push for regulation of uh, private actors in education, British International Academies, Youth Movement, and all the other providers that are implementing the LEAP uh, program in Liberia. Uh, how have we been uh, collecting the information we've, we've, we've gathered, uh, some of which we're presenting here today? We've been doing media tracking, so the media reports a lot on what happens uh, in Liberia in different sectors, uh, with uh, the education sector being no exception. So the LEAP program uh, is, 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 is covered by the media and we have been uh, following up on what the media has been reporting. We've also been reviewing uh, published uh, reports and some documents that have been uh, leaked uh, to some media institutions about the, the program as they put them out. We go after them um, to, 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 so that they feed into the things we do. We also uh, visit uh, communities and have interviews uh, with schools, uh, students, teachers, school administrators, and parents and community leaders to talk to them about education, especially uh, the, the LEAP program and what British International Academies is doing uh, in their communities or in their schools. We also have engagement at the national level with relevant stakeholders, including some of the very uh, providers that are implementing the LEAP program in Liberia. We may follow up uh, lastly on the information we gather from the field, from stakeholders, uh, engaging with the ministry, engaging with, with British and the other providers where uh, necessary. Um, at the time in 2017, uh, some of the transparency uh, issues we, we observed when we did a monitoring, independent monitoring of the program, um, we realized that there was violation of the public procurement uh, law and guideline. Uh, in particular, uh, British International Academies was hampered by the Ministry of Education to implement the program when we advocated and pushed uh, for, for, for inclusion, uh, other providers came in, uh, seven others were included into the program. There was also limited cons consultation with stakeholders. Decision making around the LEAP program was not inclusive, was not consultative. Uh, many of the inputs we provided at the time were not considered by the Ministry of Education or the government of Liberia. Um, the program documents uh, were not also publicly available. We had to push, push, and push, and, and, and use uh, other means uh, to get the, the, the program uh, document, especially so the MOU that British had with the government of Liberia. Uh, BIA at the time uh, pushed away some students. They introduced a class gap that led to a lot of students being pushed away from the schools they, 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 they operated at the time, thereby denying them access to the schools that were their ones in. And some of those uh, students ended up not going to school at all during that school year. There was also an uh, issue around fun, uh, limited information, limited transparency around uh, financials, uh, financial dealings of British International Academies. Um, at the time, uh, we also identified that there were verbal promises made to communities, even up to present, we'll come to that. Uh, much of the information that people have about what British is doing, what British is not supposed to do, uh, are, are verbal uh, information that they have. There's no document available to the people at the time when we did the monitoring that clearly says what bridge was to do or what not, what, what they were not to do uh, in the schools. And there were uh, promises that were made, uh, promises of school, many of the promises were not kept. And, and for example, they, they promised a free meal uh, for schools, the, uh, they promised a free uniform, tablet for each student, and those things uh, uh, already did not happen, especially for, except for the, uniform, one set of uniform that they provided for the entire school year uh, during the early days of the program for the students. At the moment, uh, they, they, the students are using government uh, uniforms and not using British uh, uniform any longer. We also saw uh, that at the time, they limited independent monitoring. So when we went in the field to do monitoring of the, of the, of the, of the program, uh, the teachers, the school administrators told us that they were advised uh, strongly against talking to us 
but we had to find a way to get some of the information that we collected from them. What are some of the transparency issues uh, that exist with the program at the moment? Uh, one of the things is lack of evidence-based uh, decision-making, especially so around expansion. So when the program started, the Ministry of Education said that it would have been a pilot and that a pilot uh, would have been scaled up uh, or the program would have been continued based on evidence. But even before the first year, uh, 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 was, uh, uh, was evaluated, the first year of the program was evaluated, the ministry had already decided to expand the program. At the moment, the decisions around expansion are not inclusive, they're not consultative, and they're really not based on evidence. For example, um, many of the, the, some of the schools, the new schools that have been added to the program, uh, Bridge has not taken over those schools uh, apparently uh, because they, they, they don't have resources uh, to, 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 to run those schools. Um, another issue uh, right now with the program is the fact that uh, there continues to be limited stakeholders consultation. Decision making around this program is not inclusive. Uh, unlike the other uh, traditionally uh, 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 programs funded by traditional donors in education like USAID, EU, the World Bank, uh, our Global Partnership for Education, the LEAP program is not, is not really open stakeholders are not consulted and their, their, their meaningful inputs are not uh, considered in decision making around the program. There is also still uh, uh, availability of, of, of relevant information about the program to the public. So the MOU between or the contract between Bridge and the government of Liberia, especially the listed version, is not available. It's neither on the ministry website nor on, on BIA's website for people to access. Uh, so this is a concern. This is a transparency uh, uh, issue around the program. There is still a uh, lack of, uh, of, of, of transparency around the resources that which is, 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 is mobilizing uh, to use uh, for and on behalf of the Liberian people. At the moment, again, there's no very clear information or independently audited, uh, independent audit uh, report of a detailed financial report that says exactly how much Bridge has mobilized uh, for the program in Liberia over the period and how much they've used uh, uh, on, on, on to benefit the student population. There's also conflict of interest uh, uh, in terms of how the program is being implemented. Uh, for example, some of the officials, former officials of the Ministry of Education who presided over uh, of, of introduction of the program, the scale of decision, and, 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 and some of the other things that happened uh, in, uh, in favor of Bridge and the other providers have moved on to Bridge International Academies, especially one of the deputy ministers uh, for, for, for education at a time when the, when the program was introduced. Beyond that, uh, one of the reports uh, that Bridge produced uh, in 2019 on the operation in Liberia was co-authored by a sitting uh, 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 executive of the Ministry of Education. That's also an, a conflict of interest issue that we've seen with the program. Um, the verbal promises uh, issue continues. Uh, when we recently visited uh, communities and schools uh, in, in three counties, uh, people still did not have access to information, documents on what bridge uh, 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 was to do or not do in the schools. All of the information that they had to provide with, with verbal information uh, that, 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 that came from uh, officials of bridge uh, that were to, uh, engaging with, with, with stakeholders at the local level. Even local education officials who are supposed to supervise education at the, at the local level and monitor the activities of bridge, many of them do not have access to information, documents, very clear document on what bridge is supposed to do. There is limited independent monitoring um, by limiting independent monitoring uh, by CSOs. So even as we went to the counties to engage with the people, they were uh, afraid to talk to us because uh, they've been strongly advised against talking to people uh, 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 around the program, especially so providing information on what Bridge is doing uh, in the counties. What are some of the recommendations we have? Um, there's a need for, uh, there's a need to increase transparency, uh, there's a need for evidence-based uh, decision-making, and there's also a need for effective oversight of the program. At the moment, like I said, uh, transparency is an issue, uh, consultation, consultation is an issue, evidence-based uh, decision-making is an issue. The government continues to add new schools to, 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 to the LEAP program. Just in the last school year, uh, one, one hundred
70 uh, new schools were added to, 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 to schools under the program to 350. And the overall uh, number of schools that the providers are managing under the program is 525 public primary schools. There, there is a need for uh, increased uh, civil society and citizens' engagement with the program. This is extremely important. So with the transparency and accountability, with availability of information, citizens and civil society within uh, have the, the space to engage more constructively and meaningfully with the program. There is a need to increase our uh, investment in public education. We are spending uh, below the minimum benchmark uh, required uh, 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 for public education in Liberia, uh, the 15 to 20 percent minimum uh, uh, support required from the national budget to education. This is something that is affecting education, undermining uh, the, 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 the delivery of quality, inclusive, and, and, and lifelong education like Liberia. And we think that the government has to invest more in education, uh, the minimum 20% requirement, so that uh, the, the sector has uh, what it takes, uh, appreciable resources to deliver. Uh, the last recommendation uh, is on um, abolishing the LEAP program and returning the schools uh, to government for control and management. This is extremely important. There are other issues with the program, for example, fundraising, uh, sustainability is an issue. There were uh, seven pro eight providers. One of the providers did not start in, 20, in 2016, 2017. Uh, they, they did not uh, 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 run the schools or uh, uh, manage the schools they had to run. There have been seven active providers under the program. As we speak right now, there are only four providers. Three of the providers have dropped due to fundraising and other reasons. So um, it's likely also that the remaining providers in the coming years uh, could, 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 could have funding issues even as they are having at the moment. So um, this has to be uh, stopped so that public education uh, uh, is, is, is giving attention. Government can, can, can refocus its direction uh, towards uh, delivering education that is of good quality, that is inclusive, uh, accountable, and transparent enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anderson, for your informative presentation. We'll now open up for questions and discussions. And you're welcome once again, if you have a question, please post it in the Q&A tab. So far, we have one question, and that question is addressed to you, Anderson. And it says, are there BIA schools or other commercial schools in Liberia that are not part of the PPP? So, can I answer that right away? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. So, um, commercial schools, um, they're, they're private, they're private providers, uh, for example, fit based uh, organizations that are running schools. Uh, individuals also establish and run schools uh, in, 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 in Liberia. But like the scenario in Kenya, with British International Academy, low cost uh, 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 public school, low fee public school, low fee schools, um, we really have not had that in Liberia. But companies do establish and run schools, uh, concession companies establish and run schools, uh, fit based uh, institutions establish and run schools, individuals uh, establish and run schools. Uh, but um, for example, a group like British uh, with entirely a, a, a profit making uh, a, a motive, we haven't had that kind of provider uh, in the education uh, space uh, in Liberia. So, yes. Uh, which is not the only private actor in education. Like I said, uh, the program is being uh, run and managed by uh, seven providers. Three of the providers have dropped uh, out of the program. There are four remaining providers at the moment, but the emphasis is on bridge. Maybe I didn't say this. Um, the emphasis is on bridge because this is the lead provider, the prime provider under the program. Like I said, 525 schools, which alone has 350 of, of those schools, which constitutes 67 percent. So imagine a program that has five partners, one partner having uh, 67 percent of those schools. So that is why the focus is on them, because many of the things that uh, have come up, in fact, the SSAs that have been reported of the program uh, have, have bordered around the operations of rich international economies. Thank you so much for that answer, Anderson. Um, 
I have one follow up question for you. And that's relating to some of the things you said, which hinted at a subject I'm personally very interested in. You mentioned conflicts of interest between the Bridge International Academies and uh, government officials in Liberia. And for me, that smells a little bit of like possibilities of corruption going on somewhere. I wonder to what extent um, there have been any clear allegations of corruption or to what extent um, you in your organization are considering um, really addressing this, some of these head on as a corruption problem? Yeah, so the, the, where the, the conflict of interest issue uh, has come up in the, 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 the research or the investigation we're doing, uh, we're concluding it and hopefully after that we can engage with the, with the government and other stakeholders around it. But um, there have been uh, skepticism over the period uh, when the program was introduced that those who were behind it uh, were in it for you know, personal gain, even if uh, public interest uh, was, was, was in a way at the center, although this could not be independently uh, verified. Uh, but as we've moved on uh, several years uh, into the program now, from 2016 uh, up to now, some of the things that we're seeing seem to uh, suggest a conflict of interest. That's what we're, we're seeing. Some of the officials who presided over the program have moved uh, over to bridge uh, to manage uh, to manage it. The current country director of bridge uh, used to be a deputy minister at the Ministry of Education, and he was one of the uh, main supporters of the program. The scale up uh, decision we we highlighted earlier that it wasn't based on evidence even before the the, the, the the independent evaluation of the first year. The government had already planned uh, to scale the program up, and successive uh, scale up decisions have not already been uh, based on. Uh, evidence. So um, with with this, uh, it, 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 it indicates uh, elements of conflict of interest. But then the other point that I raised was uh, the report, a uh, report on bridges operation in 2019 that was co-authored by uh, a sitting official of the Ministry of Education. We think also that a ministry that is supposed to uh, be an independent player and oversee the activities of, of all of the providers uh, in the, on the program uh, to be seen as co-authoring a report of one of the providers, we think also is, is, is an element of conflict of interest because um, how independent would, would their oversight uh, responsibility uh, be in terms of tracking what this company is doing, especially so that, like I said, uh, many of the SSAs that have been reported uh, of the of the program have, have have come from the end of British international academies, whether poor treatment of teachers, of of, of reduction of the, the the salaries of teachers during the COVID nineteen period. There are other things that I really didn't talk about because I had ten minutes uh, 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 to present. But these are all issues that have been coming up that we are documenting, and hopefully, as we put the report up, we can engage with the government, other stakeholders around it. Thank you so much. Um, so we have another question for Johnston about Kenya from Sonia. And that's about BIA's obligations to disclose financial information to Kenya's government and whether more stringent obligations can be integrated during the licensing process. And actually, I wanted to ask that. Can you tell us a bit, Johnston, on what's going on on the regulatory side, on the licensing side? Why is it that these problems are so persistent, despite the fact that there is a regulatory framework in place? Thank you. Uh, the, the experience in Kenya, insofar as our engagement has been, uh, the challenge, as you mentioned, in terms of regulation has been in terms of conflicting uh, uh, information and conflicting parties, interested parties. One, as others have already mentioned, there has been a lot of um, uh, challenges in terms of engaging a uh, bridge. So uh, it's an area that uh, even the government officials, I, the reasons I don't know, uh, there have been a kind of fear so to say in terms of really pushing for this number two when bridge uh, came into existence they they came in and uh, incorporated themselves 
a slow fee paying institution or what we call the community in schools. So, and this falls into a category we call the alternative provision of basic education. Uh, we call them abate. So this is a merger. That's why I was saying like the 3,000, over 3,000 institutions in the informal settlements, they fall into this category because they are based at the community level offering education, but with some kind of substandards level. So this is where Bridge uh, put itself. And like now with so many other uh, uh, law fee paying uh, uh, private institutions, uh, there has been no registration up to now. In 2018, the government has given them had given them a kind of a leeway because it's a conversation that started a long time ago from 2010 with the law fee paying private schools. And they said, we are feeding into the gap that, or the deficit that the government has failed to do. So with this kind of thinking in mind, there was that lenience. Yes, you operate offer education, but it reached a point now, most of them really fuel the aspect of capitalism. Now it's more of business than even delivering education. The education that is being delivered is of no quality. Now the aspect of registration came in and even that we have separate guidelines on updates for alternative basic provision for these institutions. So these guidelines have been reviewed every year, every year, even right now as we speak, we are thinking of reviewing them. But we, we sat down and asked ourselves, why, how should we continue reviewing guidelines that are not being implemented? How can the government keep on uh, giving leeway when these uh, institutions are not taking actions? This is now when in last year they came up with a harmonized document. This is now the new guidelines that has been released by the government. We supported in printing this. We have supported in terms of dissemination. Now we, in these guidelines, there is a section that has been given in terms of the abate institutions, these informal schools. Now you are saying there are only two options in Kenya. You are either register as a private school or as a public school. And this is now the implementation I started with these guidelines. Tomorrow we are having a, a leadership of these lofty pay, paying private schools in the informal settlements. We have 30 participants. We have invited into the room and we have an officer from the ministry who is going to take them through these guidelines because now what we are championing, we are saying whether you are at the formal level, what we are looking at is the quality education under the five pillars that I've mentioned. And now we need everybody to register. So whether it's bridge or whether it's any other public or private, they are supposed to register with these guidelines as either public or private. But that has been not, uh, that has been not happening because initially we had the old guidelines of 2009 that had a lot of gaps. But these new guidelines is now even composed of the new curriculum, the requirements of the new curriculum which every institution now you have clusters. You can either apply as a junior, a secondary independently. You can apply from low primary to grade three. So all those clusters have been given. So it's now each institution to choose. If you want to choose, I am at the community level. I only want to run institution from pre-primary to grade three. You can apply that within these guidelines. Yes. Thank you, Johnston. And um, I hope you'll bear with me participants if we go just a few minutes over time to answer one or two last questions. Susanna, this one is for you. Were you able to give Bridge an opportunity to respond to the findings and what was their reaction? Did they have any evidence or data-based counter arguments? One Thank, of our you. Um, Thank you, Monica. Um, for directing that question to me. Um, well, we are making, we've made this um, brief public today um, as the, with the start of this webinar. So Bridge will have a chance to read this report now. Um, but as a note on how we gathered, gathered the evidence that we have provided um, in this study, we only used information that is publicly available either because it's been published by Bridge on its own website or it's been published by others um, looking at Bridge, um, its results uh, by government bodies, uh, by, by government officials. So we only used information that is completely out there in the public domain. Um, we did run into some difficulties because as mentioned in 2020, Bridge has changed its website. Its website. Um, so the new website, from the new website, many of the previously available um, reports and information have disappeared. Um, in this case, we used uh, Web Archive Service to, to um, retain that information. 
Um, but as to your question, um, we're expecting to to have some communication from Ridge um, after this day uh, in the near future because it has been made public. The study has been made public now. But what we're saying in it um, has been out there um, in the last several several years. Thank you, Susanna. I have just one follow up question on that. It has indeed been out there and there have been lots of campaigns around this issue. And um, our, I'm aware and maybe most of us are aware that recently the World Bank decided that it would no longer be investing in bridge. Are you able to tell us to what extent this has been as a result of the global initiative for economic, social and cultural rights and other groups campaigning? Um, thank you for that question. Well, um, there hasn't been any further communication about the IFC's divestment from Bridge um, than actually stating the fact that they have exited this um, investment in Bridge. Um, but we do believe that um, it is mostly due to um, the concerns that have been raised um, over the last years against um, the activities and um, human rights impacts of um, Bridge International um academies and especially um there has been four cases filed um in front of the compliance advisor ombudsman that is the independent um accountability body for for ifc projects um and as we are speaking there are still four cases um ongoing um at this body um one case the first case that was filed um in 20 um 18, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that um, has um, alleged that many um, human rights violations occurred because of Bridges practicing, citing um, um, non-observation of rule of law, national standards um, regarding registration, um, substandard labor conditions for teachers, um, health, and rate, uh, health and safety, um, um, not meeting self and health and safety regulations, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and there are two other cases uh, that have been filed because um, um, two children had been electrocuted uh, in bridge schools, and one has died as a result, and one has been uh, had been severely injured. Um, these are in dispute resolution track. And uh, there's also a fourth case that has been um, initiated by the compliance advisor itself um, when investigating the first case, um, sexual um, assault um, allegations have been um, made to him while he was in doing his um, investigation in Kenya. So the office, the compliance uh, uh, advisor and ombudsman's office decided to open a case into sexual allegation um, uh, of bridge staff in bridge schools against uh, bridge learners. Um, so we believe these as well as sustained um, um, advocacy um, through many, many civil society organizations highlighting the human rights concerns regarding the low quality of education, um, equality um, and marginalization, further marginalization issues for, for um, marginalized populations and, and lack of equal access um, have all contributed to, to the IFC's decision. Thank you so much, Susanna, and thank you to all our panelists. Um, there is one question that I don't think we have to answer from Dennis, which I think we can is a good note for us to end on. Thank you, Dennis, who says that the main duty bearer and provider of public services is the government. And should we be advancing provision of education by the public sector? Or should we demand governments to provide public education to its children? I think that the answer is really within the question. And I know that it's the position of GIESCR and most of us probably here today that education is a right. It's a human right. It's a great equalizing force in society. The Abidjan principles are clear. International human rights law is quite clear that 
the priority and the first choice should be public education. So uh, on that note, I would like to hand over um, to Susanna to tell us a few things, uh, maybe about whether the webinar will be posted or available and any other follow-up issues um, on what we've discussed today. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Um, yes, um, the webinar has been or is being recorded and it will be um, made available to um, those interested um, um, afterwards. Um, and as um, you might have seen, the link um, to the publication we have presented um, is already available. Um, you can find that um, at our website and just scroll back on the chat and it will be there. But yes, the recording will be made available. Thank you. Thank you all for your patience. And sorry if we didn't have time to respond to your question, um, but I hope that you will continue to engage with us and we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for attending. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, Anderson. Bye, Susanna. <laughs> <laughs>